So, September 1993, I was 24 years old, and I thought I was the bomb. <laughs> I just got my master's degree in physical therapy. I had just landed a job at UCLA Medical Center, and my ramen peanut butter days were over. I was making money. <laughs> at least I thought so at the time, not really. Um, my first day of work, I go up to the ward to see my first patient. Pulled a chart, opened it up. 35-year-old female, professional dancer, lost her leg the day before to bone cancer. And at that moment, everything that I learned in school went out the door. I had no idea what to do. I ended up calling my supervisor and asking her to come and treat this patient with me because I didn't know where to begin. It's not that I didn't know how to treat an amputation. It's that I didn't know how to help a professional dancer recover without her leg. That was 20 years ago, and I have learned a lot, and today I'm going to share with you what I call the modern art of recovery. Modern medicine, wow, so many advances, so many things. We've made so many advances. What does that mean? Well, United States, every 45 seconds, somebody has a stroke. Yet, significant decrease in death rate for those who have had strokes. What does that mean? The impact is that the need for recovery significantly goes up. This is the equipment that my professors used 50 years ago to help somebody recover from a stroke. This is the equipment that I used 20 years ago when I helped somebody recover from a stroke. And this is the equipment we use today to help somebody recover from a stroke. Why is that? Why is that after 50 years we're still using the same equipment? Well, number one, it works. Number two, we fundamentally believe that if there has been brain damage, that that's the end of the story, that there is no recovery. But in the last two decades, neuroscientists have proven that to not only not be true, it can, the brain can remodel, can adapt, and can change. It can do so until your last breath. They call this neuroplasticity. What's important to understand is neuroplasticity is something that is not spontaneous. It needs to be facilitated, and it needs to be encouraged. But what also means is potential has always been there. So what does recovery mean, now that we know about neuroplasticity? Well, it used to mean compensation. So if somebody has weakness, we give them a pair of crutches or a walker. Somebody has balance problems, we give them a cane. If somebody has a drop foot where their foot is dragging, we put them in a brace. We compensate for what the body can't do. In the last 20 years, I think I'm going to change that definition a little bit. I think what recovery actually means is reconnection. So one of my favorite TED speakers is um, Breen Brown, who I'm sure many of you also know. Um, she talks about connection and says, it's the reason why we're here, connection. Connection is also what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And without it, we have suffering. So let's think about connection. In what ways do we need to connect physically? You know, we have to be able to control our movements and our bodies. We connect emotionally to how we feel. Do we have hope? Do we have faith? We, control, we connect socially to our family and friends, to our jobs, to doing the things that we love. So maybe recovery is actually the reconnection of all of these facets. Okay, so my talk is called The Modern Art of Recovery. Let's talk about the modern part. Check this out. These are equipment that has come onto the market in the last 18 months. How cool is that? First generation neuro robotics. These are all wearable robots that we actually use on our clinic today. And um, they sense what the muscle and the patient and the body's trying to do, and it completes the task for them. So it has intelligence to figure out what is it that the patient is trying to do but can't do, and a robot takes over. So on the left there, you have a robotic arm that comes out of MIT. In the middle, you have a robotic leg that comes out of Silicon Valley. 
and on the right, you have a full body exoskeleton. And what this device does is it takes somebody who, has, who does not have the ability to walk, paralyzed from the waist down, stands them up, and walks them. The key to remember in this slide is two words, first generation. Do you guys remember what first generation cell phones look like? <laughs> Enough said, you know? It's big, a thousand dollars, it was quote unquote portable. What, what do cell phones look like these days, 15 years later? Takes pictures, makes reservations at Roy's, um, you know, you can send messages, and they're virtually free with a Happy Meal. I mean, it's... I'll tell you a um, fascinating story, and I, I love this story because it's so revealing. I work with um, a little Lego robotics team, and these are nine-year-old, ten-year-old boys that are in the school system. And um, I brought them into the clinic because I wanted to show them that robotics can actually be used to help people, not just for gaming and toys. So I got this group of uh, little boys in my clinic, and I show them this robot on the right-hand side. We had a patient in a wheelchair wheel up to the robot, strapped him in, and the robot stood him up and walked him. And I explained ahead of time that this patient can't walk and does not have the ability to walk because of paralysis. And they all went, oh, wow, that's so cool. Um, after they did all of their ooing and aahing, I asked them, what do you think this robot would look like in five years? One little boy raised his hand and said, I know, I know. And I said, yes. And he said, it's going to be a pair of jeans that you put on with nanotechnology in it, and the structure of it is going to hold the patient up and walk them the minute they put them on. <laughs> is that amazing? I, I, Nine-year-old, unstressed brain. This is how creative you can be. <laughs> um, I try to get his mother's phone number, but... <laughs> anyway, so first-generation neurorobotics, imagine. The other thing is um, that we also have in our clinic that we use quite a bit is called anti-gravity technology, and this comes out of NASA. And what's beautiful about this is if you can think about um, when you're injured, if you have a weak leg, let's say you have Parkinson's disease or had a stroke or a spinal cord injury, or you had a hip fracture, ankle fracture, knee surgery, imagine being able to walk, run, jump without gravity. That's what this does. And I got to tell you, this is, uh, we have two of these in our clinic, and the hardest thing is to try and get our patients out of this. <laughs> so in my industry, um, there are a few absolutes. And one is, if somebody has complete paralysis, which means um, basically complete severing of the spinal cord, they're pretty much destined for life in a wheelchair. Right? Not anymore. This is um, a gentleman who has been paralyzed for the last 27 years due to a car accident. And this is him walking in the exoskeleton robot. Isn't that amazing? Keep in mind, he has no motor, no sensation, no feeling, no motion in his legs. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> When I watched him walk for the first time um, last year in August, took my breath away. And after that first exhilarating 15 minutes, I'm blown away by how smooth his gait pattern is and, oh, the biomechanics of what it does to, you know, when he walks. And you know what his reaction was? Oh, my God, it felt so good to stand up and look at the world eye to eye. Connection. So we know that recovery doesn't happen in days, it doesn't happen in weeks, right? Recovery is an ongoing process that usually takes months, more likely years. So how do we ensure that recovery continues, that there is ongoing recovery? Well, we got to make it interesting, we got to make it meaningful, and we better make it fun. So what does that mean? Well, we want it to be spontaneous, you know, something that people enjoy, kind of catch them by surprise. We also have to make it so that the body feels it. You, know? you cannot get physical recovery unless the body feels the strength, feels the balance, feels what it feels like to be strong, to move smoothly. And we actually do use boxing when we help uh, patients recover from strokes. And most of all, <laughs> 
It has to be engaging, and I can see that engage all of you, just a surprise of what in the world. But this is how we engage people. We have to engage in mind, body, spirit. The recovery process is not an easy one. So interesting, meaningful, fun. I want to go over a program that actually encapsulates the whole concept of reconnection. And we have a program that we uh, put together with the VA, and it's called Back to Life. And the reason why it's called Back to Life is we address specifically low back pain in soldiers coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. And if you think about low back pain, look at what he's got on. Okay? Their body armor is over 80 pounds. Their backpack is over 150 pounds most of the time. And they wear this for 18 hours. Can you imagine what that does to someone's back? No? But when we work with these soldiers, it's not just their backs that we have to think about. Many of them also have PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And many of them are hypervigilant. They have nightmares. They don't sleep. They barely breathe. And this is something that we have to consider when we think about how we help them reconnect back to their lives here, reconnect back to their family and friends, and a community. So we begin by reconnecting them physically using Pilates. And uh, it's really fun when you tell the soldiers, we're going to do Pilates today. And they kind of go, what? Um, they love it. They absolutely love it. Um, but it's about core strength. We try to build up their core to protect their backs, which they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives. At the same time, Pilates also teach breathing, fluidity of movement, how well you can move, and teaching them to move smoothly again. So we start there physically. But after their series, of Pilates um, exercises, what we then do is transition them to a recreational program. Upon graduation, they're offered one private stand-up paddling lesson. And what this does is reinforce what we taught them about the core and core strengthening. But we do it in an environment that is the most healing, which is Mother Nature. The ocean, the sky, occasional turtle. Um, can't really beat it for healing long term. So recovery is reconnection. And reconnection is something that we all in this room know a little something about. Because at some point in our lives, we all felt disconnected. And that could be from the death of a loved one. It could be moving away cross country from family and friends. It could be having had surgery. It could be a divorce. But we all know the pain, the agony, and isolation of disconnection. And we've all gone through the process of reconnection. So when I think about recovery, three things that I always try to incorporate. One, unlimited potential. Two, seek continuous innovation. Always figure out how can we do this better. Three, ensure ongoing recovery. So I'm going to end today's um, talk with the word innovation. This is a word that is used so commonly. Everyone is innovative. Everything is innovative. Every company is innovative. But what does innovation really mean for me? It's actually the humility and openness to say, tell me, show me, teach me. Thank you. <laughs>